Hello and welcome to lecture 8 in electrochemistry. Today we're going to look at electrolytic cells. Of course, these are the knowledge outcomes prescribed by Alberta Learning. They form the basis for the bulk of diploma exam questions that you'll see. Hopefully you've been referring to this page from time to time to get a sense of your mastery of the material. Uh, we've looked at voltaic cells. They're one broad class of electrochemical cells. A second class is known as uh, the electrolytic cells. Of course, we know that voltaic cells produce an electric current from a spontaneous redox reaction. Electrolytic cells, on the other hand, drive a non-spontaneous redox reaction from the application of an external electrical source. The process of supplying electric current to force a non-spontaneous redox reaction is called electrolysis. Um, electrolytic cells structurally are similar, similar to voltaic cells, except that instead of attaching an external load, like a light or a motor, an external power supply has to be attached. And uh, it's that power supply that drives the non-spontaneous redox reaction within the cell. And there are numerous important industrial applications to this technology. We'll survey a few. On the next page, we're going to see a comparison between a zinc-copper voltaic cell and a zinc-copper electrolytic cell. Uh, take a uh, particular note that the negative terminal on the power supply is connected to the anode of the voltaic cell, and that turns it into the cathode, the site of reduction in the electrolytic cell. And so here's the comparison. On the left, we have the voltaic cell. You'll see the voltmeter is registering 1.10 volts. The zinc is the anode. The zinc is being oxidized into zinc ions. The copper is the cathode, and the copper ions are being reduced into copper atoms. Cations flow to the cathode, and anions flow to the anode, and there's a salt bridge. Um, we've seen this previously. Um, on the right-hand side, however, is the electrolytic cell. And instead of a load, like a voltmeter, we have a battery attached to the system, and it's driving electrons to the what used to be, what should properly be the anode in the spontaneous reaction. It converts the uh, anode into the cathode, the site of reduction, and zinc is being reduced at the cathode. The anode, what was the cathode in the voltaic cell, is now the anode in the electrolytic cell, and copper is being oxidized into the copper II ion. You'll see there's a salt bridge, uh, and that anions uh, continue to flow to the anode, and cations continue to flow to the cathode. Uh, the applied voltage here has to be a minimum of 1.10 volts. Sometimes an overpotential is required, and we'll look at that today. A comparison and uh, contrast between voltaic and elect electrolytic cells looks like this. In terms of spontaneity, voltaic cells are spontaneous, while electrolytic cells are non-spontaneous. The cell potential for a voltaic cell we've seen is positive, and we'll find that for an electrolytic cell it's negative. The cathode is the positive electrode for the voltaic cell, and it's the site of reduction of the strongest oxidizing agent. In the electrolytic cell, it's relabeled the negative electrode, but it continues to be the site of reduction for the strongest oxidizing agent. The anode in the voltaic cell is the negative electrode, and it's the site of oxidation for the strongest reducing agent. It's relabeled the positive electrode in the electrolytic cell, but it continues to be the site of oxidation for the strongest reducing agent. Direction of electron flow is anode to cathode in both instances, and the direction of ion flow is similar in both, both instances. Anions flow to the anode, and cations flow to the cathode. When we recharge a secondary cell, we apply an external uh, supply of electricity to it, and we run it as an electrolytic cell. It sounds like we run it in reverse. So here's the reaction for your car battery operating as a voltaic cell, supplying an electric current to your car's systems. It's a spontaneous reaction, and it has a potential difference of positive 2.04 volts. Of course, there are six of these cells lined up in series, giving your car battery a 12-volt potential difference. Um, when the alternator recharges the battery, it has to supply each cell with a minimum of 2.04 volts to recharge the battery. And here's the non-spontaneous reaction that it drives. It's exactly the reverse of the spontaneous reaction if you examine it carefully. And again, just to restate that the requirement for cell potential, the cell potential for the electrolytic cell will be the value of its voltage operating as a voltaic cell. 
And if you apply this from an external source, it forces the products of the voltaic cell to reform as reactants. In some cases, an excess voltage must be applied to provide energy for gas production or to compensate for non-standard conditions. Um, and this is known as overpotential, and we'll look at an example. Um, the potassium iodide cell is often used to demonstrate an electrolytic cell. The cell notation for it looks like this. And you'll see there's 200 uh, carbon electrodes and there's potassium iodide in aqueous solution in the middle. You'll notice there's no two half cells. Um, in voltaic cells, uh, we want to separate the reduction from the oxidation so we can um, run electrons through an external uh, circuit. Here, we're not doing that. So uh, as often as not, we don't have two separate half cells operating, but in point of fact, they're part of a single cell. And we'll look at that example now. Keep in mind that it's not just potassium iodide, but it's potassium iodide in water, which has to be considered in, uh, in redox systems, as we've seen. In terms of the five-step method, then, we have to list all species present. Then we determine all oxidizers and all reducers, and then the strongest oxidizer and the strongest reducer. And we've done that here. So we've got the potassium ion and the iodide ion. Potassium iodide is soluble in water, which is why we're showing those free ions. And of course, we've got water molecules. The oxidizers are listed. The strong, uh, the reducers are listed. The strong ox strongest oxidizer is the water. Strongest reducer is the iodide. We write out the anode and cathode half reactions as follows. So the reduction at the cathode is, in fact, the reduction of water, which is the strongest oxidizing agent. At the anode, we see the oxidation of the iodide ion into the iodine. And um, the overall reaction is listed as well. You'll notice it's got a negative voltage, and that's to be expected uh, in an electrolytic cell. Non-spontaneous reactions have negative voltages. And in fact, you'd have to apply that voltage from an external power supply to run this reaction. Um, when you run the reaction, you're going to see evidence of a purple color forming at the anode, corresponding to the iodine being produced. You're going to see bubbles produced at the cathode, corresponding to the hydrogen gas being produced. And you can collect those and run a pop test to confirm it's hydrogen. And you're going to see a, a, an increase in pH at the cathode as soon as I find my mouse. And that's corresponding to the hydroxide being produced at the cathode. And again, just to restate, a negative sign for a cell potential for an electrolytic cell means that we're looking at a non-spontaneous reaction, so that an external power supply has to be applied to run the reaction. So if we want to draw a fully labeled electrolytic cell for the potassium iodide cell, let's restate the reaction, and here's the diagram. You'll see I've got two carbon rods attached to a power supply, and electrons are being driven to the left-hand side, making that the cathode the site of reduction. You notice the cathode is relabeled the negative terminal site of reduction, and we're reducing water into hydrogen gas and hydroxide. So we're going to have bubbles forming at the base of this rod, and we're going to have a, a, an increasing pH. And the um, cell potential for that half reaction is uh, negative 0.83 volts. The other terminal is the anode, the positive terminal in electrolytic cells, site of oxidation, and the iodide ion is being oxidized into iodine. I lost my mouse. Give me, there it is there, into iodine. The iodine has got a distinct color, which we're going to see forming at the base of the rod. I believe it's purple. And there's the cell potential. Of course, we're hooked up to a power supply, and this is a dead giveaway for elect electrolytic cells. There's no voltmeter. There has to be an external power supply provided. And we have two carbon uh, inert rods, and of course, we have a overall cell potential of negative 1.37 volts, which is the minimum external voltage that has to be applied to run this system. We have potassium ions in solution, and they're going to migrate to the cathode. They're positively charged, and po positive cations follow the electrons in both voltaic cells and electrolytic cells. The hydroxide, which is being formed at the cathode, is a negative ion, so it's going to flow in the direction opposite to the electrons, as we see here. And I believe that completes our diagram. Yes. 
Electrolytic cells have many important applications. Uh, for example, most metals are strong reducers, and they give up their electrons readily. In nature, they exist in oxidized form. That is, they exist as positive ions. Typically, they're bound up in oxides. To obtain the pure metal, we have to run them through an electrolytic process. We have to smelt them. Uh, what this does is it supplies them with electrons, and it reduces them back into their atomic metal form. Uh, sometimes production of metals from your aqueous solutions is possible. However, many metallic compounds are poorly soluble in water. Also, water is a stronger oxidizer than many metal cations. You'll see that if you examine your oxidation table. So it will interfere with the redox reaction uh, by participating in it. Uh, we saw this above when we looked at potassium iodide. Um, the, the water, in fact, uh, participated in the reaction, not the potassium. Um, these factors make ionic uh, aqueous uh, uh, solutions very unattractive as a source of pure metals. Instead, we often reduce metals from their liquid state. We literally melt the metal and uh, or melt the ionic compound that the metal ion is found in, and then we reduce the metal out of that ionic compound. And the example we'll look at is the down cell. The down cell involves reducing sodium from uh, liquid sodium chloride. We'll compare that with the chloralkylide cell, where uh, we um, electrolyze an aqueous solution of sodium chloride. So initially the down cell then, we're looking at the electrolysis of molten salt. And uh, the first comment uh, we should consider then is the melting point of table salt. This is an ionic compound, ionic crystal lattice. Typically, these have extremely high melting points. I believe we're running this thing above 800 degrees Celsius. Um, aside from this high temperature, the chemical process is straightforward. The products include chloride, it should be chlorine gas, Cl2, of course, which is lethal, and therefore we have to be careful with, with it, and sodium metal which is highly reactive. So there, there are several significant safety considerations in running this setup. Um, if we analyze the system then, we've got sodium ions and chloride ions. The sodium ions are the strongest oxidizing agent. The chloride ions are the strongest reducing agent. The overall reaction looks like this. Sodium ions plus chloride ions give us sodium, sodium atoms and chlorine gas. Distinct from that is the electrolysis of brine, which is sodium chloride dissolved in water. And this is not run at the extreme temperatures we see uh, we require to, to melt um, ionic compounds. Um, if we look at our reactivity chart, water is listed as the strongest reducing agent. It's a stronger reducing agent than the chloride ion. Um, However, um, for reasons related to the production of oxygen gas when we oxidize water, um, it requires added energy. And because of that, the chloride ion slips below water on the right-hand side of the reactivity table. And it will, in fact, uh, act as the strongest reducing agent and will go through oxidation into chlorine gas um, in the system. Uh, this is known as the chloride anomaly. It's an exception to the rule that the strongest reducing agent undergoes oxidation at the anode. And the analysis looks like this. We're talking about sodium chloride in solution. So we have sodium ions, chloride ions, and water. Our oxidizing agents and our reducing agents. Our water is the strongest oxidizing agent. And if you look at your table, it's also the strongest reducing agent. But because of the chloride anomaly, the chloride ion slips below water on the reducing uh, side of the table and acts as the strongest reducing agent. So our overall redox looks like this. We end up getting chlorine gas produced at the anode, hydrogen gas produced at the cathode, which also produces hydroxide. The electrolysis of water, um, the chloride Chloralkylide cell shows us that predicted reactions, reactions don't always occur. It's a demonstration of the chloride anomaly. Um, overpotential is another variation from what we expect to see in these systems. 
and we see an overpotential requirement for the electrolysis of water. When water is subjected to electrolysis, water molecules are oxidized at the anode, and other water molecules are reduced at the cathode. The reduction potentials under standard conditions for these half reactions look like this. And the overall redox reaction has a, a voltage of negative 2.06 volts. However, um, the system is acting at non-standard conditions. Water is in fact 55 molar, just about 55 molar if you do the calculation. And um, standard conditions require one mole per liter uh, solution. Water is also a very poor electrolyte, and there's gas, pr gas production at both the cathode and the anode. <coughs> As a, a result of these factors and others, a considerable overpotential must be applied to get the system to operate. So you need to apply much more than 2.06 volts to electrolyze water. <coughs> Electroplating excuse me, is another technology where metal atoms are laid down on the surface of uh, some non-participating object through electrolysis. And the object being electroplated is the cathode. It's a slider reduction where metal atoms are reduced onto the object, whether it be silverware or a car bumper or what have you. In reaction below, silver is oxidized at the anode and reduced at the cathode. So here's the half reaction at the anode where silver atoms are being oxidized into silver ions. And at the cathode, we see silver ions being reduced back into silver atoms, and they're plated onto whatever object you're dealing with. Water does not participate in electrolysis. And here's a diagram of it. So in fact, uh, the, the, um, what you see here, the anode is shedding silver ions, and then those silver ions are being reduced back into silver atoms, and they're being plated on the piece of silverware. And you'll see that the, the battery is above. It's an external power supply, so we're talking about electrolytic process. And electrons are being forced to the spoon. I lost my mouse. Electrons are being forced to the spoon, making it the cathode, the cider reduction. And, um, of course, electrons are being pulled from the, the silver ingot, resulting in the corrosion of the silver on that side. So that, that's the, that concludes my lecture on electrolytic cells. Hopefully you found it of some value. And I'd refer you to any homework that your teacher assigns uh, in this matter. Thank you.